Lizzie, welcome. Thank Thanks you. for coming. You are a woman on a mission and with such incredible purpose. When we find our purpose, I feel like there's a point where we start to look back and see, like connect the dots, like all the parts, all of the pieces come together, pieces maybe we didn't understand before, and then suddenly it, it's all clear. So what were those pieces for you? Like take us through that, you know, the before and what led you to become um, so courageous today. It's so interesting you say that, you know, when people talk about what they pray for, so often we hear that people pray for clarity. And I always am praying for clarity. In fact, on October 6th, I was at Kever Ruchel for the first time with Sarit. And that's on, that day? on October 6th, wow. um, the day before October 7th. Right. <laughs> and, um, and I'd never been to Kever Ruchel. And I, I just said, I didn't know what to pray for. I said, please, God, show me how I can best do your will so I can best serve you. Please just show me the way. And um, and, I, and I surely got it. I got what I asked for, not in the way that I wanted it to come, but I knew immediately, uh, you know, by midday on October 7th that I had a very important job to do as somebody who had kind of set herself up to be a voice for the Jewish people. You know, I had had it couple of years of training in in doing this and learning um, how to cope with a lot of the difficulties of, of taking on this role um, and I felt ready which I mean how it, which is a strong thing to say in a moment like like this and like we had two months ago but I did I felt ready I felt like okay this is it um, and I look back at my life and all the pieces if you saw them individually, would make no sense in how they individually led me here. Um, but they were all critical. You know, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and um, I grew up in the spotlight. I grew up singing on a country music show. I was a cheerleader. I was a pageant girl. I was third runner up to Miss Teen Texas. So not a traditional Jewish upbringing by any means. Um, very different from probably most of your listeners. And I, um, but it was important. No, we, we actually have listeners from all walks of life. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So, but, and I so did hear you So singing. hi, all of my Texas folks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hi, y'all. How y'all doing? Um, I did hear you singing so beautifully at uh, an event recently. You. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, they, I walked into this event in, in Miami and they asked me to sing that. They said, can you sing the national anthem? I said, I think so. As I'm singing, I'm like, oh, I hope I can remember the word. I'm like, do I know all the words? <laughs> wow. You did it. I did. Uh, yeah, thank God. <laughs> God was with me. But um, yeah, I think um, it it was important for me to, I guess, um, feel comfortable in with eyeballs on me um, and learn how to still be myself with the lights, with the audience um, and feel comfortable in that because it's not a natural place to be. Right. Um, and, there, and there's pros and cons to feeling good in that role because it's obviously, you know, you, you validate yourself based on approval from others. And But it was an important training ground for me. Um, but I never would have thought that those that those things would lead me to, to being a voice for the Jewish people. Wow. And then I um, made my way to New York to go to NYU and um, was studying music. And then um, I got involved with this Jewish outreach organization at NYU uh, called Me'or. And I was really looking for meaning. I, I kind of felt like I had had this God-sized hole and was trying to fill it with all these external things. And I also, um, so I wanted a spiritual connection, but I also felt like my Jewish identity was something that was so important to me, but it wasn't um, something I knew much about, you know, I, I knew my family's story. I knew about my family members, histories and, um, my heritage in that sense, but I didn't understand like what it meant really to be Jewish. So I wanted to go on that journey for myself, ended up going to Israel for the year to Neve after college. Um, so, you know, from like Miss Teen Texas to Neve Yerushalayim and Harnof, it's not exactly like I mean, you could not get <laughs> right. more opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, but they are both super important. And, and then I ended up 
moving back, um, I got engaged right when I got back from Israel. How old were you? I was 22. And, uh, you know, I knew that my husband was going to be my husband. You know, I, I feel like it was one of those, it, sometimes in life we're given just an easy blessing. And that was what my husband was for me. Like I knew, and I, and I say that with compassion for people who really, this is their struggle in life. And I, I have my own struggles, but for some reason, God had grace with me in, in that department. And I feel very lucky that I knew immediately that he was going to be my husband and that we were going to be together. And, um, you know, we were lucky that we found each other young and, um, it's been an amazing source of strength and stability for all of the chaotic things that I have to do. Um, is he very calm? Keeps me very grounded. He's a total square. And he, um, yeah, he's, he, he's very, um, he's not emotional, which is good. I need that balance in my life because I am all drama and emotion and heart. And so it's, we're a good, we're a good pairing. Um, we complement each other. Yes, exactly, exactly. And then, um, so we ended up um, getting married and... Um, I, so so I didn't know what to do with myself in Philly. So I ended up getting a master's in multicultural education. And so here's another stop on the journey that I never really got. And I, I was kind of resentful towards my parents for pressuring me into getting this master's. You know, I come from like the traditional Jewish parents who are like, all right, get home from Israel. What are you doing over there? You either need to get a job or go to grad school. Like you'll get a master's now. That's what you'll do. And, um, I really use so much of what I learned in that program. It also, it's where I really built my confidence as a writer. And, you know, I may not be a writer or a teacher in the traditional sense, but I'm writing and teaching every day. And so I feel like, um, all of these places that these stations that I stopped along on the way have, have really led me to this moment that I'm in now. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Like the, uh, the pageant led, you know, taught you something about spotlight and being scrutinized in a way. Right. Yeah. And then, and then, um, and that your parents made you go to that master's program <laughs> yeah. and now, and here you are. Is it where you expect, is, was there any expectation that you might be doing advocacy work or is this totally far-fetched? Like it's not actually, um, totally out of the realm of possibility because, um, ironically, my advocacy began when I was in the competing in the Miss Teen Texas pageant. Every girl had to have a social issue right. that she advocated for. And, and being what was the it? extreme personality that I am, I was like, for all, you know, I was like, the crown is my microphone. I'm going to change lives. I'm going to make an impact. And immediately started um, like connecting to this idea of making cha- positive change in the world and connecting with young people and um, opening minds and hearts. And uh, so I feel like I've really um, always kind of had a passion for this, just the, what I was advocating for has changed. So my my platform was diversity, education, and awareness. And I chose it because as growing up as a minority, as a Jew in Fort Worth, Texas, I knew what it was like to be different, even though I didn't necessarily look different. Right. Um, And, you know, I, I've always been a bit idealistic in thinking that um, if we could just see each other as human beings and kind of let the things that are different <clears throat> be put away, put pushed off to the side and really just see the humanity in one another, it becomes much harder to hate someone when once you know them. Um, and I still, I still do believe that. I mean, that is who I am at my core. And I think that's why I struggle so much in situations like now where there is just blatant hate. Right. I think you're right. I think you're right in general. I think with Jews, it's a little different. I think with there's, there's a historical hatred that is hard to explain because the hatred came in so many different forms and it's, it's a massive challenge. Yeah, it's whatever was um, the worst thing in society to be at the time. That's what the Jew was. 
Yeah, and actually it, we were talking about the Lubavitcher Rebbe just before. He had shared that anti-Semitism is there. It's like it, if, someone, if someone is feeling hatred towards a Jew, it's something that they've had within them and there's nothing much that you can do about it. Yeah. How do you feel about that when you're, when you're speaking about anti-Semitism? I think like what can, what it, do you feel you can do about it? I think it? it's caused me to really shift where I put my energy. Um, because I didn't want to believe that I couldn't open up people's minds and hearts. And I've had to come to accept that because there comes a point where you realize, like the Rebbe said, that you're never going to get through to people who don't want to open their eyes. They don't want to see you for the human being you are. Because at their core, all they've ever known is hatred for you. Um, even if maybe they were hiding it very well, there comes a moment in history when society is vulnerable for some reason, and that's when it all comes out. The truth comes out of where they really stand. So I've realized like I can't, I can't put my energy into trying to change those people. But what I can do is try to empower my own people right. to feel um, to feel strong in who we are, to feel proud of who we are, um, and to feel a connection to each other and to God and to just the very sense of being a Jew. And guess what? That's what the Rebbe said to do. To, oh, really? To take that and be a proud Jew. And wow. you, yeah, not to feel like you have to defend, but to really have inner strength and pride in who you are. So... You're doing, you, you, you've got the clarity. You're doing amazing work. Well, thank you. I wish I got to meet the Rebbe. I love that that's what he said. Yeah. He, he had also said not to compromise either, to be proud of who you are and not to give, give what's, what's yours. Yeah. As in our land. Our land um, and any piece of ourself. You know, I think, I love that. Um, I love that because we, we look at the Rebbe as this, um, for me, at least, like as almost this like um, iconic figure, you know, that, you know, on such a pedestal. Um, and to think that that is something that he said, that we should not compromise, we should not give up our land. Because um, I feel like a lot of people would want to rewrite that and say that that's not what he said. Because he you know, used he to get loving. so passionate about that. That was something he was so passionate about. He used to speak to many of the prime ministers about it, and he he's, said, "He's so right." I mean, yeah. look at this. Look what look at look the at results. what happens when we look at Gaza. Look at you know any time that. Did you always feel that way, or is that something that's no? I mean, I I I grew up very idealistic. Let's have peace, two state solution, which you know we we've come to realize through this very moment that you can't. You can't have peace with people who want to kill you. So that's just not, it's just not possible. As much as I would like to go in there and deprogram these ideologies that are so deeply ingrained within the extremist, radical Muslim society, it's just not, it's just not possible. How can they unlearn something that is the core of who they are? Which, exactly. you know, their, their only value is to kill us and to, and to eradicate the state of Israel. So you can't negotiate with, with that. And I, I, you know, I think I've realized that, um, like the Rebbe said, um, it doesn't really matter what the rest of the world thinks. You know, we, we don't need to be on the defense. Exactly. Exactly. Because when we're on the defense, they pick up on that. And we never win that way. No. Who wins on the defense? But if you're proud of who you are and you're on the off offense, yeah. <laughs> um, then they'll come along. Yeah. They respect it. They respect it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think we need to stop apologizing. Yeah, we, exactly. You know, we, we, we seem to be apologizing a lot. Like there's lines like, um, what, what do you hear often? Well, I mean, um, we're in a world where we just want validation and we just want people to accept us and be okay with us like someone hating you is a very it's it's a scary feeling when you said that you're all heart I was thinking it's hard for someone who is not emotional to be in this position of advocacy we interviewed Ben Shapiro and he was telling us how he does it and I'm thinking okay well he's a guy 
I feel like maybe it's sometimes easier for guys like us women, especially. I'm trying to picture Ben Shapiro getting emotional. I mean, I've definitely <laughs> no, he even him. said like I, you know, I, like I think he's emotional in a yeah, different no, way. No, I've seen him. No, I saw him when he did the when he when he showed the footage, some of the unedited footage, and you could see that he was really yeah get bringing the. I mean. But right. that it took a lot. For it him took to, a lot. Yeah. It took a lot. And yeah. but despite the fact that he's not an all heart kind of person, it's still really hard for him to do what he does. And you are a an all heart woman. You have children. I feel like knowing that these are many young girls who are still held hostage. It's just so hard to to fathom what it's like to have to stand up or not to have to to feel like you got to stand up and speak up for our nation when there's so much hate and backlash how do you how do you do it emotionally how, how do you do it I feel like I have no choice I feel like it's why I was I get emotional talking about it look at me I'm all heart um I feel like I it's why I was put here in the, for this moment um it's um it's the only thing that matters is is my people and any of us would do anything that we can. And, you know, I feel I was blessed with a platform and, a, and an audience and it's my job. And so, you know, I think about our soldiers who are putting themselves in harm's way, you know, sacrificing everything for us. And if they can do that, you know, for me to go and talk to my phone and, and put myself out there in that way, like, it's nothing, you know, so I have to. Um, but the, the hardest part for me is that um, I internalize everything. And, you know, talking to these people who are going through the, the worst moment of their lives, the most unimaginable pain and struggles, I take it on, you know, it's because yeah. it's a collective pain. It's where it, we're in an international state of grief. Yeah. Right? And um, I have a hard time compartmentalizing. Um, because I'm so connected um, and it's so it, it's made it hard for me to function outside of this work um, and I haven't been doing a good job of it you know I in what way like um, just no sense of balance it's hard because you're doing something very intense yeah and then With balance no isn't balance isn't intense right <laughs> yeah yeah balance is more yeah it's hard. Yeah. I think being an intense person and doing something intense, it's really hard to balance things. I haven't, um, you know, well, I also got hit by a car. When? Two weeks after the, uh, two, I got home from Israel because we were there on October 7th. And then uh, two weeks, I think it was two weeks later, I got hit by a car, broke my ankle, busted open my head, had staples in my head. And oh, my God. So I was like, <laughs> sorry, I was immobile. Mm -hmm. Um and so it was, um, and everyone kept saying to me, this is God telling you to slow down. Right. And of course I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, I still have my voice. That's all I, yeah. Uh, um, but um, I've totally neglected my mental and physical health. I mean, I my diet has been completely in the toilet. My I've not worked out. I'm not sleeping. But I, I mean, I feel like I'm in crisis mode. The problem is that this is not, this is going to keep going. Like I, I have to find a way to work through because this is this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And right. unfortunately, I don't see. I do believe that the better we do in the war, which we will, because we have no choice and we're going to be successful, the worse it's going to get for the Jews in the diaspora. Yeah. And so I, and that's where I feel like my biggest responsibility is to to the Jews outside of Israel. So. I need to be strong for them. And, and so you also to need to take, out. yeah, to figure that out and take care of yourself a bit too. Yeah. I can relate to you actually. Now I'm saying you've got a big job right now, but I also feel like I have a big job because I make matches and I oh, felt yeah. like during this time, there are so many people that have come to me that have said, I want to marry someone Jewish now that were dating non-Jews before. And oh, I just, I'm like, that's, sometimes I just wake up early. That is so four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, I have to find this person. Before somebody. they change their mind. Yeah. <laughs> And just to continue the Jewish nation. And so I know what you mean about like, and my husband will say you need to so, slow down. And I'm like, I cannot slow down. No, this is, <laughs> that is the most important work that anyone can do right now is, you know, the continuity of our people and the perpetuation of, you know, that's our future. So 
There's yeah. nothing more important than making Jewish matches. Yes. I love that's music to my ears to hear that not that Jews want to be yes, matches. Something Jews. has an awakened in people's souls. You know, well, obviously, like even the unity is our souls connecting because we realize we all do love each other. It's a victory. Yeah, and then that that does that on a on a personal level that will do that that can do that same thing with a couple. You know. Yeah, Feeling absolutely. Like, I feel like I want a soulmate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I feel like everyone's ready. Time, yeah. It's time to get serious. Yeah, it's time to get serious. Well, you definitely have the right mindset with what you've been sharing. And I actually just thought of that line. For example, I wrote it down. Um, for example, when someone says Israel has the right to defend themselves. So why even say that? Like, why even say that you have the right. Like we, I was discussing with Ida, like it's just like, it's like saying I have the right to have my home. I have the right to have my children. Like that's not even necessary to say. It's just, this, it's is, obvious. Our, this is our land. Yeah. It's Eretz Israel. It's um, the land of our people. And yeah. And I don't have to say I have the right to have this. Yes, you're exactly right. That statement is a defensive statement. Yeah. So do you find yourself ever feeling like you have to defend yourself? I think I say things, um, but in my heart, I don't feel that we need to defend ourselves because, but it is, it's hard, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're only, you know, such a tiny percentage of the, of the world. And so to feel like, even if you know the truth, which we do know without a shadow of the doubt, mm -hmm. this land is our land. This land is my land. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> I don't know we, if it's we, your we land, all, but it's our <laughs> We all um, have something, we all love music. Oh, like amazing. Ida plays piano. I we was should a, have a kumzitz. Yes, is that what they call it? I was it? a singer before. I was a health coach and before I did the matchmaking. So we all. We should do a concert. Yeah, we should. <laughs> you never we know. Should. Maybe one day. Do so you have Maybe. a keyboard here? Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we sing for women. Oh, okay. Amazing. Yeah. But um, Kalisha. We can do a Kalisha concert. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. When I found that out, I was like, no, no, I can't, uh, I can't, can't, no. You can't deal with that. <laughs> I hear you. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> That's why I ended up doing other things, because I found it. Yeah, I was like, no, thank you. But I, there was something very special about women uniting together. It's become, like, un incredible. Yeah. These girls that are singing, they're like rock stars. Yeah. Cult followings, like, I've never seen anything like it. I don't know if it was always the case or if this is like a new I think because trend. there's all these bakes and people are lighting Shabbat candles, I think women are feeling very empowered. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, these concerts, they have thousands of girls there. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yes. I need to get my girls into the into Jewish, the singing the thing. The female, well, not, they, they, they shouldn't be singing, but they can um, listen to the female vocalist. <laughs> God bless them. They have a lot of good qualities. But, but your daughter was, I just saw a video. I shared it this morning. Your daughter, daughter was interviewing one of the mm -hmm. um, victims. Well, her father was in. Yeah, her father is in Gaza. Her father he's is a, in yeah. Gaza. And she's a 14-year-old. She's 14 year old, and your daughter is how old? She's 11. She's 11. And she was interviewed asking her. I, I thought, wow, like mother, like daughter. Yeah. She's so brave to be sitting there. And, and she was sitting there with such compassion. She's not a normal 11 year old um she's very intense and in her head um and not she's not like extroverted in the same way that I am but I've never met any other I mean I'm obviously biased because I'm her mom yeah <laughs> but she her emotional quotient is just like through the roof like the way she knew how to sit with this she understood her and, and uh she did wow yeah because she was she, speaking in a vrit. I just watched this this morning. Wow. Her daughter wow. interviewed a girl, a 14-year-old girl whose father was taken to Gaza. Wow. And in front daughter. of her. Yeah. And she, and, you know, just to see the connection between the, you know, my 11-year-old and this 14-year-old who's really going amazing. through. Yeah. That, I, cri I cried you, watching that. I, I mean, know. it was, it tears your heart out. Yeah. And then the interview ended and they were talking about how much they love Sephora and that broke my heart too, because I'm like, this is just a teenage girl yeah, who wants right. to go buy her skincare and drink her hot chocolate, and she's instead living through a nightmare. And it's um, yeah. like, how can we go about our normal life when when but our the people thing is, are is that you are doing by you doing what you're doing, you're giving her hope, and you're bringing light to our people. Hope so. That, a lot that's of times what you I have don't to keep feel, telling yeah. yourself. Like if you were sitting just lying in bed or, or doing what you did 
before you did this, what would, what, how, how would you be helping her? Yeah, you're right. I feel like it's a privilege to get to meet these people and to share their, their stories. I do. Yeah. And, and we get to, and for us to take them, take it in and, you know, I think it's, I, I agree. It's really hard. Like watch that this morning. I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I going to go about my day? But you, you have to find a way. Just you take it in and then you're just like, I have to do something for them. Yeah. You let it be the spark. Yeah. Do you, um, do you feel that discomfort is a prerequisite for growth? And what discomforts, and if so, I guess, what discomforts have you had to embrace or accept on your journey of growth? I don't know yeah. why we all laughed because it's so true. Uh, <laughs> I've oh, never, yes. yeah, I don't know. I can't, you know, the, the most um, change I've seen in my life has, obvi- has all come through struggle. And, you know, I would say it's a lot stronger than discomfort. Discomfort would be like a very generous, kind word to right. use for what it what it's really felt like. Um, you know, I, I am very open about the fact that I have, um, really intense demons, uh, that I, that I fight. Um, I think we all do, you know, it's a human yeah. thing and it's a Jewish thing, the Yetzirah and like, you know, my mom used to always say, Lizzie, you have a devil on your shoulder and an angel on your shoulder. Like, which one are you going to listen to today? And I'm like, I want the devil. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. <laughs> Can I just pause and tell you something about that? I was thinking as you were talking in the beginning because there is a Yetzahara and yeah. a Yetzatov. So we have a, a, an animal soul and a godly soul. The animal soul can be used for evil, but it could also be used for good. Like you can elevate the animal soul for good or for bad. Um, How would you it's, elevate it's it for good? It's neutral. So for example, you, you're using your, like in the beginning, not that you were using it for bad, but you weren't elevating it yeah. in the beginning, your advocacy. Yeah. But now you're using it for the good. Right. Yeah. Or right. you could use your words to say bad things about people or, or even or you could use them for good. Fascinating. Yeah. Well, at the so extreme level, like, uh, you can have someone who could be a murderer and then they can become a butcher and, you know, cut meat right. for kosher meat, let's say. So I think that says that, that, that in the Shalman. <laughs> 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 so your, your intensity, you could use for the good or you it could, intense, oh, yeah. could lead to rage. I mean, we know what, what intensity could lead to, but yeah. I'm saying... This is good. I'm glad you're telling me this because it actually helps me reconcile a lot of who I am. Yeah. Um, and I've seen it go both ways. Right. You have that, like the best thing that you are can also be the worst yeah. thing. Yeah, and it's really good or really bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I've... So you were saying that... Well, I've oh. always been... Um, I come from a family of perfectionists. You know, I, a B in my family was like an F. So I only made <laughs> one. It was an 89.4 in my eighth grade oh English my gosh. class. What Miss pressure. Lemon would not round up one, that point, that tenth of a percent oh, for my. me to get an A-. minus. Um, and I'm still bitter about it. Not that I'm, it's fine. Working through it. Working through it. Okay. Um, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I always held myself to such a high standard um, in terms of external approval, in terms of what I thought things looked like, not necessarily what they felt like. Um, and it really ate me alive because that was like my – that was um, – but that was like the pinnacle of success to me was make the straight A's, look perfect, sound perfect, be perfect. Um, and obviously, like, there's no ability to achieve perfection as a human being. And you're setting yourself up for failure. And um, so, you know, I have, I, I, I think I have like a bit of a death drive. And like when something is going really well. Like I want to mess it up. Um, or I just yeah. have this like rebel rebellious, like, you know, I tend to have issues with authority, which, you know, didn't make me a really good employee, but you don't like uh, following rules. No, <laughs> never been a good rule follower. Yeah, um, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> that, makes, that makes you a leader. So I like that. That's the other side. Yes. Of it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You yeah. can't follow. You Break gotta the lead. That's the positive channeling of the. <laughs> That's the positive that yeah. side to it. So yeah, I got um, I got into I got I was using alcohol as a crutch and and other substances for years, um, and I was very high functioning. 
you know, from the outside, most people wouldn't have known that I was really struggling and dealing with this. And I will tell you, like, for a while, it worked for me because it took the edge off. It allowed me some sense of relief. And I didn't know any other way besides that. And I also never thought I could be an alcoholic because there was nobody in my immediate family who drank. So it was not even on my radar that that could be a problem. Um, and it, and I became very heavily dependent. Um, and it really, um, it really started to ruin all the things I loved. You know, it, it was taking away all the joy from my life. And I think I had been making excuses that it was helping me to let loose. Yeah, or to man, it wasn't that I was like out partying. I did plenty of that. But, I mean, let loose yeah. from your perfectionism yeah, or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. To like, it enabled you to do what you had to do. Yeah, so it was like a helper almost. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and I think it was until it wasn't. Right. Um, until it. Be- what do they say? They the solution became the problem. Yeah. And right. so that that's exactly what happened. And it just was. Um, I became obsessed with knowing that I had a problem, not wanting to give up my best friend, which at the time, you know, was alcohol and not p- being able to envision my life without it. Cause it was such a huge central focus in my life. Um, but knowing that it was going to take away my family, my career, um, everything that mattered to me, I saw like I was going to lose everything. I had, um, like a, a rock bottom moment um, which most people probably wouldn't think is cra- like anything so insane, insanely rock bottom. But for a perfectionist like me, it was like my worst nightmare. I was on an Instagram live with um, the Israeli consulate of New York with thousands of people watching. And I was, it was in the conflict in Gaza during 2021. And I was, had drank so much that I, took some Adderall, which I was not prescribed, to like try to get myself back, uh, you know. In the zone. Okay. Yeah, in the zone. And I, my mouth was so dry that I kept like going like that uh-huh. with my mouth. I looked like a disaster. <laughs> and people were like, what's wrong with her? Like, is she cracked out? Like, is she, and I was mortified. And my husband afterwards said to me like, what is going on? Like, and I'm like, oh my God, this is all I've wanted to do is to feel like I can make an impact, to feel like I can use my voice to do something good in the world. And my issues with alcohol and addiction are, are getting in the way of that. Like, I'm not going to be able to have both. And um, and it just, you know, unfortunately took me a few months to be able to finally surrender and and commit to... To make it Yeah, and it, but it's the best the best thing I ever did. And I know, you know, in those embarrassing moments, like in those moments of struggle where you, you feel like I'm never going to recover from this. I'm, uh, this is going to be what defines me for my entire life. And in a way it did define me because it was the jumping off point to really make a change. Right. Right. But, um, and I, I'm like in a weird way grateful for that because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have the life I have today if I hadn't gotten to that place. Right. Um, Hashem gave you this opportunity to be in front of thousands of people for you to recognize that you needed to make this change in that most difficult moment. I needed to be in front of an audience and have that much on the line, you know, to understand the gravity. Somehow it's always that way. Like you have to go through this intensely dark experience in order to get to a really good place. And I saw the Israeli consulate a few months ago and I brought it up to him and he had no idea what I was talking about. He didn't know. I... (laughs) I would like for me, this was like well, the worst moment noticed. of my life, of course, because he knows me. <laughs> and I was like, maybe there's a language barrier. <laughs> like, but I, you know, I had, I w- was well, always so he scared. He may to have see thought him. you had a twitch. Maybe. You know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I have yeah. one. I just, <laughs> no, well, where no, was, I um, where, what, what, what kind of relationship did you have with God at the time? Like, what was your relationship to spirituality while you were going through that difficult time? So I always, um, I shouldn't say always. I um, I felt a deep connection to God, um, starting from the towards the end of college when I started delving into learning about my Judaism, um, and I I really 
would have qualified myself as an agnostic person before that. Like, I don't know if there's a God. Maybe there is. I don't, you know. I feel very Jewish culturally. It's important to me. I'll marry a Jew. But I didn't, um, I wouldn't say that I had a personal relationship with God where I talked to God ever. Um, and, and that's really when I developed a relationship with God. But something happened. Um, I think I stopped. I think I started to be so self-reliant that I kind of removed God from the picture. Like I just, I felt like um, I was in so much self, self-centeredness, self-will, thinking that I was running the show, that I was in control of everything, um, putting all this pressure on myself. Um, so there was really- There was no space. There was no, God. yeah, there was no spirituality. Um, even though I believed in God, I wasn't, I, I wasn't activating my relationship with God. Right. and. That's what's all changed for me in the past two plus years is that like I, my life depends on my relationship with God and like my personal connection to God. And it's not, it's so much more than just being a Jew. It's. So what, what are some of the things that help you connect to God? I talk to God like out loud, which I think is, I probably would have thought was insane. And I know uh, a lot of people do this, but. It really helps me. Like I connect so much more that way than when I will, you know, sit down and read a prayer in Hebrew or say to Hillam because I didn't grow up doing that. So I don't necessarily connect on the same level that other people do to that. But when I just talk and like consciousness, like asking God for help, um, you know, I wake up every morning and I talk to God. I, you know, I thank God for keeping me sober. Um, I ask for God to um, help me to do his will and to not do, not to think that I am going to achieve my will because I saw where that's led me, um, which is not to a good place. Um, and then, um, and then connecting with others because I feel like so much of my uh, my demons come alive in, in isolation when I get stuck in my own head and I really need to talk to other people who understand me um you know other people in recovery who get me um and and you know I have amazing support uh spiritually as well like I'm incredibly close with my Rebbitson who is like one of my closest like it's crazy to me that like my Rebbitson is one of my closest friends but just being able to Share reach out her. to people and, and have raw, honest conversations and not be embarrassed to, to bring up the struggles of what I'm going through, you know, for even, even like, like family purity stuff, like just whatever it may be, like there can't be any secrets. Family purity is a, a great connection to God. Yeah. 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 And um, by the way, the Tehillim, I found when I read the translation, it's really helpful to connect. Okay, like, I'm going to try that. Tell with the translation. I want to tell you that what I shared with you about the animal soul and the godly soul, that's actually Tanya. Really? It, it was written by the Alta Rebbe. Yes. And um, you really get an understanding of yourself and who you are and how you can be the best version of yourself. Tanya. Yeah, Tanya. Okay. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be Lubavitch by the time we finish this interview. <laughs> I'm ready. But I like the talking to God thing. I think that's very vulnerable yeah. as well. I just, I, I want to feel like I'm in a personal relationship with God because I am. Yeah. You know, it just makes me feel like I, it's not some distant you know, theoretical thing. It's real and it's here right now. Yeah, I think it's the antidote to, to, suffer, to all suffering is that connection. Because we all know there are people who have lives that are more difficult than us and they can be happier. Yeah. And there are people who have lives that are easier than us and they can be less happy. And I feel like, not that there's one common denominator, right? Everyone has different predispositions. But at the end of the day, the thing we've heard so much here is that through God, they just felt this relief from the pain and suffering, no matter what they had been through. And that's the thing. And I think that's maybe what what helps drive you and keeps you so courageous yeah. is knowing you have God on your side. It's like the Jewish people are so small. Yeah. But we believe that there's a higher power. But if power. God on, God's on your side, it can be one person. Yeah. You can do anything. Just look at our history. I mean, if, if I ever have a moment where my faith is wavering, which I have frequently because, you know, it's hard not to. Right. But... Um, I just see like how miraculous our existence is and it, it's only possible. 
and and even our struggles, what we're going through, it, like it's so illogical. The rampant anti-Semitism. It must, it must be the way it's supposed to be, and I I have to have full trust that I'm not running the show here, even though I want to be. I wish I could be the director. You know, <laughs> I would be doing it much differently, but I'm not God. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's I I'm just I'm just here to do my part whatever that, you know, whatever that looks like today. Yeah, and it's amazing how that trust that you have is what pulled you, like your, your, it sounds like your ego was so, um, I guess, overwhelming, yeah. was it? Yeah. In when you were taking alcohol and when you were worried about being a perfectionist, but then when you let go of that, um, that's where you allowed her, God to come in. Yeah, it's exactly right. It made so space it's, for it's it. So it's humility. Yes, Exactly, exactly. Knowing that, um, you know, I'm just, I, ha I really have no control. I, ha I can only, I have control over very, very little. You have um, control over how what, I react, how you share, what you yeah. do. Yeah, and like, you know, I, th all of these horrible or great things may happen. And um, it was, uh, I'm this, the famous psychiatrist from, the Holocaust survivor. Oh, Victor Frankl. Victor yes, Frankl. Victor Frankl. Yeah. That there's that the moment between um, uh, you, uh, you can't uh, the, the, the when something happens and when you react to it, and right. that's when you have your choice. Right. There's that and one moment. That yeah. one moment, and that's that's all we have. Yeah. So, but that's what gives. That's where we have power. So I try to just focus on that. Like I can't control all these other external things, but I can control how I react to it and what I do with it. Um, and I feel like um, the answer, this is going to sound so corny, but like the answer is always to, to come at everything with truth and love. Yeah. So. I think truth prevails, even though it's hard to see right now. Yeah. Yeah. But truth is truth. You can't fight the truth. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. And you don't have to defend the truth. No, you don't. <laughs> and it's comforting to know, all right, it's cool. You believe what you want. That's all good. You want to have your eyes closed and your ears closed, but we know. So we know that you've been very open about some other struggles that you've had in your life, one of them being infertility. Mm -hmm. So um, we wanted to know what made it you, what motivated you to share your story publicly? Like, have you found that to be impactful and helpful to others? It was really um, the beginning of my uh using social media for advocacy i didn't know that that could be done you know at the time when i started talking about pregnancy loss in 2017 it was still a moment where instagram was a place of highly curated images beautiful pictures a highlight reel of perfection people weren't really using Instagram to like be vulnerable, be vulnerable. and cry <laughs> and talk about like w what was really happening. Right. Um, and I, you know, it was such an impulsive thing that I did. I remember just sitting on my couch and I felt like I'm posting these pretty pictures of my life and nobody knows what I'm struggling with. And I feel so alone right now. And, um, I'm Is this sure before you had any children? I had uh, my older two daughters. You know, it's interesting. I I suffered with infertility through both of them and did not open up about it at all. Didn't talk about it. My best friends didn't know. My parents hardly knew until I was, you know, deep into the process of IVF because um, I didn't – I was worried that they would judge me or worried – you know, I just – I didn't know if I was ready to, to share about it. I, right. I felt ashamed. I felt – guilt um, which is so common and so unnecessary right. but right so I decided to talk about it and um, my husband was in the OR and I remember I was like I should probably ask him before I go <laughs> yeah and but then I was like no He's, uh, he's going to so say no. <laughs> I'm like, so, I'm so dangerous. I'm such a liability. He's definitely would say no because he's very private. And it's interesting because he's really come full circle. Like he's my number one supporter with sharing about the most vulnerable things. Like I can't believe that he's, he pushes me to talk about, 
sobriety and recovery, which, you know, he was very ashamed of, of that for a while. And now he's like, you're going to help people. You should talk about this. And so it's I guess amazing he changed a little bit because, because of you. Maybe I think he, just seeing, seeing what it did. Yeah. yeah. Seeing how many people, cause everyone's suffering from something. Right. And right. everyone's trying to uphold this, especially in our community. You know, it's like, are you going to get a shit up the mom? You know, it's right. like, you know, the second you start to show any of your weakness or vulnerability, it's, um, you know, we don't talk about that. Right. Like, so. And also the demons feel so much scarier when they're not shared. So it benefits yeah. all of us to share our experience. Totally. Everyone has something. Everyone, everyone has something. And just know, I think everyone should know that when you talk about it, and I'm not saying everyone should go talk about it, but right. at least at, try to be a little more open about your experience. You'll see. Well, just that it's you're like having a hot anticipatory day. anxiety is always yeah. scarier than the actual thing that when it happens. It's so right. much bigger in your head. Yeah, yeah, True. always. But yeah. sometimes, like I don't know if this. Well, it seems like your husband is happy about it, but he is. You're sharing that he yeah, is. Yeah, he came out of saw the you car though, and he freaked out on me. <laughs> what did you just do? Oh, so you did oh, it? Oh my, because his phone was blowing up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened? So well, no. So it. he he uh, he of course like ultimately was very supportive yeah. and saw. I mean, because it became this like global movement, right? Um, that I didn't see coming. Right. It was just That's like, amazing. it was like the the right place at the right time, you know, and I think there was such a need for people to start talking about this. Right. It wasn't my, int- I wasn't like, I'm going to talk about this because nobody's talking about this. Right. It was it really just a was selfish a endeavor. Well, I think when, words that come from the heart enter the heart. So it came from a very general, genuine, vulnerable place. And that's yeah. why it entered everybody's hearts. Exactly. Yeah. But there yeah. was no motive other than to just feel less alone. Right. No, so I will. I'll ask. I, w- I was going to ask you: Do your kids and do your husband? Does your husband? Does it ever get to them that you're sharing? Um, or are they accepted it and they're cool with it? I'm trying to. think. I hope that's not too. No, not at all. No, that no. I I um no. I'm trying to think of of a time. Um. Gen. Uh, I think my husband's knee jerk reaction to everything that I share that's personal is, "Ooh, why are you doing that?" Right. Um. But I think he accepts that this is who, he, who he's married for better or worse um, and generally always sees the positive from it. And my kids... That, that's very courageous of you because you, like we were talking before this interview and I can see you really respect your husband. Oh, yeah. But then to trust your intuition and go and do something and not knowing if he's going to be a, cool with it's it. It's almost like something comes over me and I, I feel like I it's like this like this itch that I have to scratch, like I have to share this. Like, yeah, like uh, yesterday I I started writing poetry uh, just in the past two months because it's been like a creative outlet. And um, and I was like, I, I wrote this poem and I want to share it. And and my husband's like, what? Like, why? What's the point? He's like, <laughs> I don't understand. I don't get it. But, you know, I don't even know where I was going with this. No, but... I'm saying I asked you if they're ever bothered by it. Yeah. No, I think I think he he it's hard for him to understand it because he's built so differently. But I think he I Sees think he does. does. Ex- I think he accepts <laughs> it. I think he just it's you know, there's no turning back now. And my kids also like they're. I guess it's all they know is and and it's really it's given them not my three-year-old because he's too young to really understand but involving them in this work has given them a sense of purpose and you know there was a lot of trauma for them being in the bomb shelter in Israel on October 7th and hearing and everything that they heard and and it was impossible to shield them from the panic and the just you know just right. the devastation yeah um and so to be able to feel like they're actively involved and in, in doing something has been helpful right. you know not that i i would ever push them to do something they're not comfortable with but i, I think no doubt they're very proud of their mom i hope so i, I think they're i'm just their mom i don't know <laughs> yeah they get annoyed though when oh, i shouldn't even say this but you know it's people will ask them like are you so proud of your mom and um but they get i think that um it's i think it's it's hard for them in a way to have um a celebrity mom yeah i don't it's not that i i don't think of myself as a celebrity but i think sometimes they just want the they um, just want a mom right 
Yeah. And that that's that's part of the, I guess, the sacrifice. Or yeah. The, all the good things come with its things. Exactly. And I I will always be gracious to everyone that I meet that wants to have their have a moment with me because I it, that's the whole purpose right all. so of course I'm going to stop and talk to anyone who wants yeah. to talk to me so and this is where Hashem has led you comes with its things yeah how do you handle criticism when it comes your way it's been a journey um I used to be I used to take everything so personally and now now I really value criticism I mean of course I always consider the source but if it's yeah. coming from somebody that I trust that care, or, and cares about your mission and you yeah I I I appreciate it. Like, I, I think that the worst thing that can happen to somebody is that they get to a certain level of perceived success that they, that people around them stop Sharing. giving, stop giving right. them any sort of negative feedback because how are you supposed to grow? grow? Yeah. So I, I do value it. You know, it's kind of one of those things like at the, at the beginning, it hurts to hear. And then you, you start to think about it and you realize you they know. might be right. <laughs> yeah. And like God is probably talking through this person. Right. That's true. And what about people that you don't know or, you know, messages oh, that I you just get? Let it roll off. So you don't yeah. care about that. I mean, every now and then somebody will say something that will really push my button. Yeah. And then I have to look at that. I'm like, why is this one comment making, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it could be, right. it could be anything. It could right. Be but hateful comments on social media are so triggering. Like, even if they're not even, you don't even know who they are. Just like yeah. reading that under something that you post is just, uh, and that's the, the hard thing to separate. I think yeah. eventually we all learn to do it. Yeah. But I don't know. Like, easy. there are certain things. I think when I have shared my singing, it's very vulnerable for yeah. me because I'm not, I'm not a professional singer, you know, and I. You sounded professional. <laughs> no, I mean, but it's, it's very, it's like bearing your soul. Yeah. Right? And it's so, very vulnerable. so for somebody to to criticize that, it's oh, it's very painful. Yeah. I mean, because well, it's subjective. Let them get up and try and sing. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Have you you guys know the the Teddy Roosevelt man in the arena quote yeah, that Brené Brown? Yeah, I mean, yeah. but it's true. Yeah, like yeah. they're so not the in quote, the arena. What's the quote? Oh, it's very long. Oh, but um, basically, <laughs> unless you're in the arena. <laughs> Don't tell me anything. Right, yeah. Exactly. If you're not in yeah. the arena with blood and mud on your face and you're not fighting, yeah. then, and you're in the nosebleed section over there, then what you have to say to me, right. it's just like. If another singer said something to you, yeah. then you can take it seriously. If you had some positive critique. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I feel like, but it's also so subjective. Yeah. But I exactly. guess everything is. But yeah, Everything is. There are some people that are going to love your voice and some people are just yeah. going to be critical of it and. Yeah. Well, I, I always it was find myself apologizing though whenever I share myself singing. I'm like, I know this isn't very good and it's very flawed, but I just wanted to share it because it was a raw moment. And then I'm like, why am I doing that? Why? Yeah, just, I don't do that with the other things I share, right. but it's for some reason. Because it's singing, like a, I know what you mean. It's just a vulnerable thing. Yeah. And yeah, you want to feel like how you feel in your soul when you're singing, the yeah. people around you are feeling too. Yeah. I'm like, is this translating to how I feel to your ears? But yeah, and sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Well, <laughs> you know, the Rebbe once he said it to my grandfather. Actually, um, my grandfather was Rabbi Chaim Gutnick in Australia. Uh, he was uh, the rabbi of. He was known as the rabbi of the Holocaust survivors. Actually, wow. He inspired them when they came, um, when they came from europe to australia wow. and he uplifted them and gave them hope and he, the rebbe once said to him he told him to give tarot Bacha classes wow. um, yeah in in australia um and family purity classes and he said i don't know if anyone's going to show up but the rebbe told him to do it anyway and then um he told he uh, he came back to america on a visit and he told the rebbe you know only one person came and the rebbe said teach well, it he yes and <laughs> he said and how many mothers did Moshe Rabbeinu have Wow. In other words, what? Yeah, you, only you, one. You only need, yeah, even only if you need touched one, one person, one person is <laughs> it. Like that's it. It's true. It's true. And yeah, I mean that. I think about that yeah. all the time with with everything. It's like if it's if this is having a positive impact on one person, exactly, it's, it's worth it. Yes. Yeah. But back to the infer infertility. So yeah. 
what do you what what is your goal for that like when you share what what do you feel that it has done for women so my goal is to help women feel less alone yeah because it was such an isolating moment for me and I felt so much shame and guilt and um depression like situational depression around it and um I knew logically that that there was no reason for that, but it didn't. It was. It wasn't a rational feeling. Feelings aren't rational. Right. So, um, so I just kind of wanted to make it okay to talk about, and I was blown away by how many people were touched by it, because so many women, as you can imagine, have gone through similar struggles, and just like, you know, within an hour, like a thousand messages from people who were either you know, wanting to wish me, well, like, you know, send me prayers or um, like asking me for my Hebrew name or to share their own personal stories with me. Um, And I was like, whoa, like, I didn't realize that this visual platform could be used to actually have real connections with people where we can like get real and, and help each other and build a community. Like I didn't, I never really thought of Instagram as a community before right, that. Right. Um, and it sort of got my wheels turning, thinking about what else I could use my platform for. I was like, oh, this is, it felt good to me to be actually making a positive difference and not just like showing off my cute outfit. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Like right. I do, I think it's great for people that if that fulfills them, there's a place for that. Like I think fashion's a has a role, an important role in the world. But for me, I needed more. I like needed a podcast more. from the inside out. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What yeah. did you learn about yourself uh, through this journey that surprised you or that you didn't know before what, about you? Uh, which part? Like what, what um, something that <laughs> yeah, you didn't know about you. <laughs> so a lot of things. Yeah. So I feel like in my own life, what I discovered was that it's specifically on the path that I'm resisting that my purpose lies like that's where it is that's and so, so profound. it's like what I'm fighting that's where I need to go and um and so that's when I asked earlier about the discomfort that's sort of like my mo there's got to be a, a certain level of discomfort that I feel where I know okay this is it this is it because if it's just if it flows then it's maybe not 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 for everyone but I found yeah. that to be true for me so that was like a truth that I learned that I didn't know before about about myself I feel like the most probably the most important lesson that I've learned um, is to trust myself and to trust that God is going to if I if I let God in and trust God that that um, that I don't have to um, that I don't have to worry about anything because I think I spent my entire life trying to be something and like holding on with a death grip um, and not be not having no ability to let go or just like not trusting that the words that would come out would be the word the right words or that um, you know the role I'm playing would be the right one just kind of fighting every step of the way and I think I've re- I've I've learned that I have to just trust um, and it's not easy because I don't think it's a natural thing. Um, for me at least, you know, for a lot of people probably. But when, whenever I'm able to do that and just let go, it's, um, it's always works out exactly how it's supposed to, you know? Yeah. It's like I don't have to try so hard. Yeah. I, I would say for me it's probably that my mistakes are my biggest teachers. I love and, that. Yeah, and often my mistakes are my lowest moment, you know, first just after the mistake realizing that I've made a mistake and that that's when I'm where I'm going to learn something yeah and grow from that yeah and not seeing it as a negative right because I can also be a perfectionist and to admit that I've made a mistake yeah um but to do that and then (laughs) I'm perfect (laughs) and then to grow from it is one of the biggest teachers for me but and also the trust and also what you're sharing I think all three (laughs) yeah and I think um like knowing that it's okay to need people and need God and not right. be on this solo mission. Yeah. Because it's, I mean, everyone in the world, you know, you were talking earlier about it doesn't matter 
how hard or easy life is for people um, that doesn't equate to to happiness um, like if you know just because somebody's wealthy doesn't make them happy and you know that right. there are t- I heard a story about you know people in DP camps that were just you know caught up in their love affair and like so happy and you know we at, at our core we all just want connection um, to each other and I believe to God to, yeah. to some sort of spiritual tie um, to know that something bigger than us is is in control of everything so like you know it's in order to have connection we ha- we have to seek that out right so not yeah. being not being so in here but being yeah. able to reach out That's yeah really being inspiring. able to be vulnerable I want to ask if we were talking about from the inside out and that it used to be about your dress and all that kind of thing. So I know you're very open also. You're married to a plastic surgeon. Yeah. And Botox is a thing. Oh, and yeah. I, <laughs> so I just wanted to know, like, what it, you look amazing. Oh, my gosh, you're so and sweet. Do you have a perspective on aging and, like, what do you think about that? And are you going to continue doing both? Like, do you recommend it for everybody? Do you just look at it? Like, what? T- tell I me your perspective. Well, I don't on... think there's a one-size-fits-all for anyone. Yeah. Like that. I really, and, like, I, I feel strongly that everyone should do what they. I would never look at someone and be like, "Wow, you would look so much better if you." I wonder if you're saying that to me. <laughs> no, I, no, because it, it's a personal. Yeah. Um, right. I don't think lines and wrinkles are bad. I I don't like them on myself, right. but I don't. It's not that I dislike them on other people. Like I, um, but I think I would. You know, I don't think that there's a blanket statement to be made about anything cosmetic. Um, I, that's just my, my perspective. Like, but I, I happen to like the, you know, to having the ability to take the, you know, I feel like for me, it's no different, maybe because I'm married to a plastic surgeon, it's so accessible. It's not something that I maybe would have sought out if it wasn't so easily accessible. Of course, I'm critical of myself because I see myself on TV all the time or on my phone all the time. So I'm much more hyper aware probably than the average person who just catches a glimpse of themselves in the mirror and is right. like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so, so I feel like that that is probably a part of it, and that's probably also why there has been such a trend towards overdoing it. Um, I think some some people really take away from their natural beauty, and I I want to look like myself. You know, that's important to me. But in the same way that makeup is just enhancing your features, that's how I see like plastic surgery or any sort of like you know. A non-invasive procedure or whatever but is like it something did, you plan to do for many years to come i haven't really thought about it right. i mean i don't have like a strong opinion about it it's not something i like wake See, up thinking about i'm not like my husband usually is the one to be like oh you're you need your botox like right i, I don't um every now and then i'll be like oh i i'm like i see i'm seeing my crow's feet now but it's not something that i it doesn't um it's I'm not, not something... emotional about it, right? If that makes sense. But I think people should do what feels good to them and what feels right. But like my husband always says, um, you know, he's not in the happiness business. He's in the making people look better business. So like, if your happiness is tight, if you think your entire perspective and outlook on life is going to change when you no longer have like a number eleven here, you're wrong. So right. you know, it's just it's like making money. It's like that's not yeah. what's going to buy you happiness. No. Maybe for an hour. But it helps. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. It doesn't hurt. Right. Yeah. Everything. You get used to everything and, and then you're on to the next thing. Right. There's no limit to, you know. Right. We, we're always chasing. Right. So that as long as there's no dependency almost because this, uh, in Shara Bitachon, which is a book Rivka and I are big fans of it. Well, it's we, one of the books that we, we gave it to that you. We brought oh, for good. You. Yeah. I'm so, thank you. Yeah. It's thank really, it's, it's a life changing book. I've been looking for a spiritual book. read. So yeah, it's just, um, it's one of those things that you do a little bit of every day and you start to, it opens up your eyes to a whole new, a whole new way of looking at the world. But it says that if you don't put your trust in God, you're by default putting your trust in something or someone else. And for everybody, everyone has their version of God. Yeah. Right. And so w- if, Beauty is your version of God. If, if if you one day are not as beautiful as you were before, and then your life you feel like your life is over, then good luck. You know it's it, got. To... Yeah, and I I think I always say that like I don't I never want to. Um, I believe beauty is a tool, and right. um, it's you know 
it's important. It's a gift. It's, it, a, it's gift, a gift. Like from God. Yeah. yeah. And it's, 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 a, it can be used to have a much larger effect than just what the eyes perceive. Right. Um, well, it's like what we were discussing in the beginning. You could use it for the good. Yeah. Or you could make it superficial. But, exactly. But it, but it should not be the basis for what you value yourself. And I, I never want to, I would never want to be known for my looks. Like I would never want somebody, the first thing somebody say about me to be the, oh, she's a beautiful girl. Like I would want, I'm so much more interested in being known for the work I'm doing, you know, my, and my passion that I would hope that that would define me much quicker than the external, you know? Right. Well, that's, that's very meaningful. That's a meaningful thing to say. (laughs) (laughs) No, I mean it. I mean, it's just, there's just, this is just the package, right? Like, and not to, and we shouldn't neglect the packaging. And I think that a lot of the issue with Israel's PR is that for so long we have neglected the packaging, not that the PR matters based on what we were saying before, because the truth is the truth, honey, who needs PR? Yes. But But. I do think that the packaging, we shouldn't, it should be, you know, and, and, and the Jewish well, people do value things beauty. With, with pride. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yes. Right. <laughs> so Shays, Rabbi Shays Taub shared this great uh, thought. So we have, we have this verse, Shekhar Achein Vehevala Yofi, Isha Yeras Hashem Kiti Talel. So, you know, um, uh, charm is false and beauty is, uh, is fake, but a woman who fears God should be praised. And he said, if you take um, charm, that's equivalent to zero and then you have beauty and that's equivalent to zero but then a woman who fears god then you put a one is equivalent to the one that you put before those two zeros and suddenly those two things the beauty and the charm are you know compounded in their effect so it can be your beauty can be used as the most incredible um tool. channel and tool I to mean, make a difference at queen esther and i mean exactly That's they talk great about example. beauty Sarah so much in the book bu- yeah all the mothers were beautiful all of them and they talk right. about it in the torah yeah. so it must be important yeah you know it, and it but the way that it's presented is that the the internal beauty and the external beauty were were kind of one that it was there were not really separable yeah um it, i mean and that's so what, obviously and that's what we have to balance yeah is yeah well didn't god braid chava's hair when you know that it, never heard yes that it, really i don't know either. if it's a medrash or but yeah when when eve came into the picture before she was presented to adam god braided her hair uh-huh. so you know wow it matters right. brush your hair right, braid your hair. right. yes <laughs> Yeah, just, we, well, we are in a physical world, and we want yeah. to elevate it. So, you know, we need to take care of ourselves too, and appreciate the physical world with the intention. And you can follow my husband at Doctor Iris. <laughs> That's kind of right. Okay, say that <laughs> at Doctor at Doctor Iris Savetsky. He has a very conservative hand. Okay, well, <laughs> very talented. Include okay. the link in the podcast. <laughs> we we notes. can include the link in the podcast. Yeah, yeah, notes. Sure, why not? No, he's and amazing. like you said, it's it's just a if someone feels that that's something that they want to do yeah it's not it should be only for yourself right you know that's that's the that's the key yeah it's got to be for he you he has by the way a, a large amount of from women who come to him because they want to feel good for themselves they come alone they don't come with their husbands um if if they come with their husbands it's only not because they want their husband's approval or opinion it's so big support, support. Right. But yeah and it there's like a new wave of um Religious women coming? Well, I think um, it's like a confident, like it's like I'm going to take control of what I want to take control of, Yeah, you know, and we have so little control. If this is something that gives you a sense of that and makes you feel good, then I don't, I don't see a problem with yeah. it, but yeah, everyone's like, what's wrong with the way God made you? I don't know. Well, why do we, why do we do anything unnatural? So, right. Um, I hear you. I hear, <laughs> I hear that point and I hear their point. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I yeah. hear both points. And, and like you say, it's really about how you feel. You're going to feel more empowered. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And to keep in mind, like the physical and the spiritual, that you want to balance the two. And yeah. that you're like, like you said, you don't want to be known for your beauty. You want to be known for what you're doing yeah. that's meaningful. And that's and um, to, to remember that when we're beautifying ourselves, that we want to be in line with God's What is world. the larger purpose for yeah. the beautification? Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, we all need reminders once in a while. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So if you could send a message to your younger self, or really to young girls who, let's say, would aspire to be like you, 
um, and use their voice and um, share their message, what what message would you share with them? What would you say? Um, I would say don't be so hard on yourself that um, it's all it's all going to work out if you're open to help from others, help from God. You don't have to do this life alone. You don't have to do this work alone. I know it sounds so corny, but trust trust the process because sometimes like the journey is the destination. And like, I, I, I believe that even now, like um, I don't know where I'm going. If somebody would have asked me my five-year plan five years ago, I never would have thought I'd be in this position today. And this is truly a life beyond my dreams and a purpose beyond my dreams. So um, staying open and, and knowing that um, everything is, is happening exactly how it's supposed to happen. And, you know, you're not defined by your failures or your successes. It's just all a part of it. Beautiful. Can you also share a message or two that you have found most impactful that you, during this time, being an, an advocate of Israel, um, something impactful that you've shared that you felt actually made a difference that maybe we could all share at our Shabbat table or with the people around us? Oh, this is a tough one. <laughs> I'm going to need to think for a second about um, about a message. Um, I think it was um, Maimonides who said that um, the truth is the truth no matter how many people believe it. Um, and that's something that I've really had to hold strongly to because um, the noise is overwhelming with the falsehoods. And it's hard not to let it penetrate, especially if you're on social media like me. Um, it's not that I believe the lies, but um, it, it can make me feel helpless. And so just remembering that um, the truth really is all that matters. And, and that's, and when we have that, there's nothing else. There's so nothing better. There's nothing better. Um, so holding strong to that would be, um, would, would be probably my most important message, you know, just that's great. trust the truth. Right. That's amazing. It also teaches you to, to think for yourself. Even, yeah. even when there's a majority that thinks one way, it doesn't mean that they're right. That's a really hard thing to do. Like there's a, there was actually, there were several research experiments where they tested that theory, uh, like where the majority, like will a person change their truth for the majority? Right. And it's called the Solomon Ash experiment, where you, like you saw three lines, yeah, the three lines, and one was shorter, the, the other two were much longer, and uh, they just had like five or six people say no, they're all the same, um, they all have the same uh, measurements, oh and this one guy. And it, it was done several times, and this one guy just went with the majority. And this was on video. This wow. is what we do. It's like when everybody thinks one way, we're just it's the we go we go with the with mob the, yeah, mentality, the yeah, right? Yeah. Mob yeah. mentality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you remember I think, when we interviewed Rabbi Y Y Jacobson? Jacobson we were I was talking just about that it. concept, and he was saying he was in an airport with his wife Esty, and. Um, they were late for their plane and everyone everyone seemed late and rushing and they were all crammed down this one escalator yeah and um his wife said to him do you see there's an empty one right over there and like, why is and nobody like, going why and they just got everyone just follows and it. follow and everyone was just following like you just follow the the herd. follow the pack yeah um it's and yeah yeah they took the empty seeing one it in real time yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think, and the, one other message that I, I would want to share is that, um, you know, don't don't be afraid to put yourself out there if you feel like you have an important message to share. Um, because, you know, I've seen how much impact one person can have through the work that I've done. And just, like, I can't believe it. I look, I look at the impact and uh, that, like, I look at myself, I'm like a five foot one, nothing little like Jewish girl from Texas, like what? I wouldn't think I would be able to have any influence, but just putting yourself out there like day after day and speaking the truth, um, it really does matter. And I, it's not that everyone needs to be on social media, but I, everyone has their own sphere of influence and not being afraid to 
speak up, you know, because I know it's scary for a lot of people who are afraid of losing friends or, or business or Have you lost followers. anything along the way? I lost a lot in 2021. And um, when I first started advocating for Israel during the conflict in Gaza then, um, a lot. I mean, I lost followers. I lost friends. I lost, I got dropped by my management company at the time um, because I was no longer marketable. Um, it was, but it's, it, you know, the low points are the, right. the point. The because look what happened now. Yeah. I was yeah. like, all right, I'll lean into it. Right. You know, it wasn't as positive as that. I was like, okay, I guess I have it was nowhere hot. else to go. So yeah. Yeah, but I knew that I had to go- keep going in this direction. Right. I wasn't going to like stop doing this so that I could maintain all these false relationships right. that I now saw so differently than I had ever seen them. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I now I've gained so much um, career wise, friendship wise, but the friendships that I have with people who align with me have gotten so much more intensified for all of us, you know. The connection we have with each other um instagram followers my followers have grown not that i'm doing this for that i wouldn't care if i lost i would still keep doing what i'm doing because i i know it's the right thing to do but um do you ever experience fear like there's probably I, do you, you get death threats i do but i have like i don't know i um there was a moment where i was afraid maybe um last year when um my husband received a letter to like a physical letter in the mail to his office like with the anti-semitic threat um but for the most part i i i'm not scared i i'm angry (laughs) um what do you do with your anger well i i try to channel it into the content um right. try it's doing. passion you know that's i would say like and this is something that is i think universal is the more we move away from ourselves the more we're removed from our truth and try to please others the more anxious and fearful we become yes and the more we move closer toward our truth the and we'll probably lose friends if we do and maybe maybe yeah it, it's a chance it's a risk we take but um, I heard Jordan Peterson say, and I love this. He said, okay, it's risky to be yourself. Yeah. It's definitely risky to step into your truth. But try not stepping into it. Yeah. Because there's risk there too, but we're, we're not even thinking about that risk. I mean, right. so the yeah, risk, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what that is the ultimate risk. It, right. To right. not be true to you. Right. I mean, there's no, what are, what are we here for? What's the point of all of this? You know, we if we can't be true to ourselves... And for me, that came down to being able to stand up for my people and, and, you know, not feel that I was going to have consequences in doing so. I'm like, well, this is who I am. This is my core essence. So I'm going to do it, you know, and it's, it's empowering, right? you know, and every time that I lose anything because of it, I'm like, well, I wasn't meant to have it because this is all that my life is about. And that you should just know that is betachon. That is trust. Really? Yeah. Because you're you're living your truth and you're like, if I don't have those things that I wanted that have been yeah. taken away from me, that wasn't meant to be. I mean, yeah. yeah. And it you're going to enjoy the betachon book. I'm going to. <laughs> but it I'm says very people excited. that are not afraid. Yeah. They, they don't experience fear and suffering. Maybe like the immediate fear you know, of like, you know, yeah, threat. Yeah, I was at this that. event the other two nights ago and um, – there were so many, it was a pro-Israel event and there were so many protesters banging down the walls and the doors and so many people in the room were scared. terrified. And Where was this? It was um, It was downtown. It was an event that Donna Karen had hosted, like a very high profile, like VIP type of crowd. Like a lot of people that may be scared who aren't super vocal, either because they're not super informed or they're afraid mm-hmm. because everyone in their worlds are not standing with us. Um, and I I don't understand that, but I respect that they feel that way. Um, but I, I wasn't afraid at all. I was like, I was pissed off. I was, <laughs> I was just mad because right. I felt like how disrespectful that these, that these animals would interrupt such a 
um, emotional, like a moment of, of grief that we were all having together. Um, like they don't, they're claiming to fight for humanity, but they don't value our humanity. So um, I was angry, but I wasn't scared. And, you know, I, I do believe like, I don't know. Sarit tells me all the time. She's like, you're on a mission. God, you know, if, if, if anything bad is going to happen to you, like God has to uh, be on board with that. And like, I, I don't, I mean, I, I By the way, for all our listeners, we have episodes with Sarit. She's, <laughs> she's amazing. She's a healer and she, and she's done a lot of healing she's with been, Lizzie. Yeah, she's been a very key player in my life and in my current path. Um, and she, you know, I've always struggled with why bad things happen to good people, but I trust Sari and she, has, you know, it's true. Like if you're, if you're on a mission, I can't believe that God would let anything happen if, I mean, I, or if it does happen, it, it was supposed to. Right. Well, we actually asked Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs that question. I want to hear. Why do bad things happen to good people? And he said that the answer is that there is no answer. We're never going to know why bad things happen to good people because if we knew, we'd be complacent. We, right. we need to fight for justice. Right. And we need to fight for the good. But if we knew the answer, we wouldn't fight for those things. That's true. Yeah. So that was his answer. I see that in my own life all the time, how when something bad happens to an innocent person, it lights the fire. Look at us fighting for all these hostages right now. Yeah. Yeah. But we want to get to a place where we just see the revealed good and that we're still fighting for, for the good. <laughs> I know. I don't know if that's, is that part of the deal? That That's Mashiach coming. All right. Well, I'm ready. <laughs> is your suitcase packed? Yeah, we've got to pack our suitcases. <laughs> I know. Maybe I should just start leaving <laughs> by the door. Leave it by the manifest door. Manifest it. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow, idea. unless Mashiach. We should comes. all pack our suitcases, go to Israel, and demand Mashiach. Yeah. What would happen if we did that? Well, let's give it a well, go. People think we're nuts. <laughs> I don't know. I think everybody wants well, it. We don't care what people think. We just <laughs> want right. to. I wonder if we could. Like, we should just start a movement. A Mashiach movement. Well, I mean, that's been done. Your <laughs> yeah. people started that, I think. But but maybe a move like a move to Israel with your suitcase movement and demand Mashiach now. I, I like it. I I'm like in. it. I'm in. Um, all right, let's go. What are we waiting for? <laughs> are we for? doing it for Pesach or what? No, I think we have to now. go sooner. <laughs> yeah. If we, if you want, if it's urgent, we there's no time to waste. Yeah. Do, it was do, does demanding Mashiach actually bring Mashiach though? Well, yes. Oh, yes, it helps bring Mashiach. I thought it was acts of kindness. It is, but demanding Mashiach is being very proactive in doing our part. It's praying and it's doing acts of goodness or kindness. Right. And just being very passionate about it. What is it? Acts of kindness will bring Mashiach now? Or what is the, the yeah. Chabad mission statement? It's to do acts of goodness yeah. and kindness. And that will help bring Mashiach. Okay. Let's do all, it. All four corners of the world. Right. Right. Well, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. We do have a lot of work <laughs> Not to us. Do. <laughs> we all, each no, one I'm of kidding. us. <laughs> <laughs> and we were born because we matter. And we yeah. each have our unique mission. Yeah. But... When you're ready to pack the suitcases, we'll tell our families I'm ready to do it. <laughs> I have to do it first? I think we all have to collectively do okay. it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which one of us has to do it first? Oh, I, I just know. got back from Israel. Oh, yeah. Have a coin. <laughs> Roll a dice. Um, maybe. <laughs> okay. Getting back to you. Yes. Um, Let's move on to the quote now. Yes. Okay. So we always end with a favorite quote. Oh, gosh, I wasn't prepared for this. See, yes. this is when the notes would have come in handy. Exactly, yeah. but you've done very well without notes. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> you, you can think. And, um, and you can share a couple. Of co a, a favorite quote? Yeah. Well, I mean, a timely quote would be, um, obviously, I'm so wrapped up in the fighting for Israel right now. And so I've been reading a lot of uh, Golda Meir, uh, I've been reading her book, Lioness, which I highly recommend if you're down for a biography. Okay, we'll get it. It's, there's, there's a movie out about Golden Age. Yeah, I saw it. I interviewed the director, actually. It was, um, he was, a, it, it's crazy because, you know, the movie came out in August. Just, you know. Yeah, it's crazy. Who knew? Uh, but the 
there's a lot of parallels to the to story what's happening of the now. Kippur. Yeah, I was even thinking that waiting time, you know, that waiting period, and that was I was thinking about that during the waiting period when the soldiers weren't going into Gaza yet. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and I mean the difference is now obviously it was civilians who yeah. were attacked, not soldiers. And although we've had plenty of civilian attacks over the years, it's not. I mean. Is There's, that a book that just came out? Or? Lioness? No, it's, uh, it's, it's an, an older one. book. My rabbit scene, actually, when I got hit by the car, she recommended okay, it. Okay, well, so. I'm going to get it. And so the golden quote that I love is, if we have a choice between being dead and pitied or being alive with a bad image, we'd rather be alive with a bad image. Um, and, you know, that is, it, I have to always come back to that because it doesn't really matter how the world perceives us. It We have to live and we have to survive and are fighting for our very right to exist as a people and as a nation is not something that we can compromise on. And it doesn't really matter what the world thinks. Yeah, so. that, that's great. Love that. that important one. Ida, I thought maybe we'd all, why don't we all share one? Well, you said you had another one. I wanted yeah. to know. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, Brene Brown is a hero of so many of ours. And I, um, I actually found out um, early into my sobriety journey that she's also sober. And yeah. I loved learning that about her. I did not know that about her. Yeah. She's yeah. sober. And um, do you, did you have her book, Daring Greatly? No. Oh, it's do really I need good. That no, it's all too. about vulnerability. Oh, well, the birthplace of change, honey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so the Brene Brown quote that I love is, only when we are brave enough to explore the darkness will we find the infinite power of our light. And I, I resonate with that so deeply because it's through my darkest moments that I have been able to find my purpose and without really being brave enough to go through, walk through the darkness, cope with the darkness, um, I would not be able to walk in my purpose. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm grateful for the darkness, which I never thought I'd be able to say, but I truly am. And, um, you know, I, I, I hope that, I hope that my light is shining. I try very hard to, to let it shine. This little light of mine. <laughs> we see it and we feel it. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah. we, we thought maybe, Ida, do you want to share a quote as well? Um, I have to remember it, though. How about you, you share one first? <laughs> now, I was thinking because we were talking about Tanya and you said, hey, maybe that's something I will do. Actually, in the first chapter, there's a, a line, Ki karav alecha hadavar me'od b'ficha ovovavcha La Soto. It's close to you. That very thing is close to you in your heart and in your mind that you may do it. And that very thing is that is that connection to God and bringing the godliness out in us, wow. reaching our potential. And when it's saying it's close to you, it means like that potential. We have that potential sitting right there. Yeah. We just need to tap into it. And um, in, in your heart and in your mind that you may do it, it'll reach your heart when you use your mind and you control your mind through action. You know, the thoughts that you're thinking that know that aren't going to serve you a good purpose, don't put them into action. Yeah. Put into action or stop those thoughts yeah. and do, think positive thoughts and then put them into action and then you'll start to feel it in your heart. I love that. I, I always have to remind myself that I am not my thoughts. Yeah. And that, you know, because the, those demoralizing thoughts have a way of creeping in, but we can change that. We have the power to change that. Yes. that That's amazing. And I, I, I also remind myself every day that God is closer than my own breath. That's it's right. right there. I just have to choose to tap it, tap into it. Yeah, that's exactly tap right. That. Mm-hmm. Tap it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sure. Okay. Um, okay, so faith and fear both demand that you believe in something that you can't see. So you choose. <sighs> wow. And... Uh, it just speaks to me because either way you're you're moving. So, what's the better option? What's the greater risk? I think it's something worth contemplating. What do you choose? Faith what are you going to choose? Fear all yeah. day, every yeah. day. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's an active choice that you have to make repeatedly. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I love that. We give so much credit to our feelings, not enough credit to action. Action. Yeah. That's what we're all about. Turning yeah. inspiration into action. Exactly. So. Yeah. <laughs> if we can believe oh. in something we don't see, let it be faith and not fear. Right. Right. Yeah, On that amazing. note, I, I think that you are, you are living by that. And we are so inspired by speaking to you today, 
you should just continue going strong from strength to strength and clarity i mean and yet you should have clarity along your journey and and joy i'm so humbled to be here you both of you beautiful women inside from the inside out inspire me That's... and it's it's really an honor for me to sit here in your presence and you know to to be given this opportunity um you know i never would have thought that i would be some somebody that you would want to hear from or have here and I'm grateful it doesn't, you know, it's not something you take for granted. No, thank absolutely. You. Thank you. Thank absolutely. You. We're so grateful you're here and we're so honored you're here and keep representing us the way you do. Thank you. Thank you so much.